the whole country cares about is, why did I not see my relative, my son, my grandmother, my parents? Some of them were ill, some of them have died. Why did he get to see them? Well, the problem is that permission was probably given by Boris Johnson. He would have got permission to break lockdown. He was in contact with number 10 cabinet office all the time. Johnson is tied to him on that particular wheel of fire. Now you also have to wonder what else Dominic Cummings has on Boris Johnson. But I think there's more. I think without Cummings, Johnson's government would be empty. Dominic Cummings is a really key character over the last 20 years of British politics. And he's mainly hidden in the shadows. I mean, he started in the early noughties on various campaigns, no to the Euro, and then no to AV. And he has, he was an advisor to Ian Duncan Smith. And on the right of the party, though he says he's not a Conservative, has been an incredibly influential figure. But the culmination, of course, was his running the Vote Leave campaign. And that moment when he got both Michael Gove and Boris Johnson to support that campaign, and that shock result gave him a lot of power because nobody thought that Vote Leave in concert with Leave EU would win that election. And we now know, obviously, lots of dark things went on with both campaigns, both being fined by the Electoral Commission and found guilty of wrongdoing with data. And in the case of uh, Vote Leave, Dominic Cummings' campaign, he boasted how much he used the internet. He made a big deal about the billions of ads they bought in the last few days of the referendum. And we now know at least £600,000 of those ads, which probably we estimated had hit 13 million people, was spent illegally. It was an overspend to another group called Believe. What happened after that is, according to his own account, he then left Boris Johnson and Michael Gove to sort out taking over the government. Well, that was 2016. We know that went wrong. Theresa May won that uh, leadership election. Boris Johnson was Foreign Secretary, Michael Gove was part of the administration, I think, for a while. But basically, it didn't go his way until 2019, rebellions against Theresa May, and Dominic Cummings is bought in. I don't know if he helped Boris Johnson's campaign, a lot of money for him spent to win the leadership, especially from hedge funds and city traders, but he was brought in as his chief advisor. So he is, people call him a cuddle Rishner, an eminence grease, a kind of a Sputin-like figure in the shadows. Um, those are a bit unfair, some of those descriptions, but he's an enormously influential person. And the fact that Boris Johnson had to defend his actions breaking the lockdown shows his power. So why is he so powerful? I mean, that's the question. I mean, I think, my personal opinion, this is a personal opinion, is that Boris Johnson is not a great policy person. I mean, he's figurehead, really. Why he needs Dominic Cummings is Dominic Cummings is actually the centre of government. We now know that, you know, one of the reasons Syed Javid refused to become Chancellor or resigned was that Dominic Cummings wanted to dictate who his special advisers were. Dominic Cummings uh, runs, helps run the comms for the whole government. And we know, you know, from the searches of Byline Times that, and public statements, that he has this huge project to centralise all government data, the government gateway, and even more importantly, has amassed a war chest or an investment fund of a billion pounds, about 850, I think, to be precise, for his pet project, which he calls ARPA. It's a research agency based on the US agency, which became DARPA, a defence agency, and is fascinated, as you read by his blog, with data, predictions, chaos theory, Bayesian pr pr uh, predictability, super forecasters. He's kind of one of those characters who likes to see the world in silico, in the computer, as a model he can play with. And this has been his long-term dream, apparently on his WhatsApp, get Brexit done, then ARPA. Now what happens is something unpredictable comes along. I mean, there's no doubt Dominic Cummings is on the right of the Conservative Party. He says he's not a Conservative. If we look back to a foundation he created, the New Frontiers Foundation, it's very right-wing. He personally hates the BBC, thinks it's a mortal enemy. A close associate is Daniel Hannan, who said the NHS is a mistake. And he has an ideology, a kind of populist ideology, as displayed in Vote Leave and the last general election. He is willing, and we've seen this back in the noughties on his campaign, to use the NHS, to use the idea of elites, 
to attack uh, what he sees as the governing elite to create a new elite, I'd say a techno-libertarian elite. And he's also an admirer, has expressed admiration for Vladislav Surkov. Now, Surkov is Vladimir Putin's key propagandist, and not just an image propagandist. Surkov was very influential, for example, in the annexation of, of Crimea and the war in Ukraine, those stateless Donetsk and Luhansk, Surkov was there. An information war, if you like. Now, we know Cummings spent three years in Russia in the late 90s. Not quite clear what he did there. And, you know, his brother-in-law has Russian connections. That's not extraordinary in London in the noughties and 90s and in the last 20 years because there's so much Russian money flowing here. But you can see the Surkovian hypernormalization doctrine in everything he does. Listen, you know, there's two Leave parties. Now, he hated the Leave EU uh, campaign, apparently, but it served his purposes. He used a company for his digital ad placements called AIQ. AIQ was an offshoot of Cambridge Analytica. And Leave EU, as we've seen from invoices, had modelling done by Cambridge Analytica. So they're post probably drawing on that same database of 75 million hacked um, Facebook accounts where everybody is psycho psychometrically profiled. So it's great on the digital arts and he has been incredibly successful. So it, well, I don't think it was a surprise the last election, but it was certainly a surprise to the Conservative Party to have a first big majority since 1987. So he holds um, Boris Johnson in his hands in many ways in terms of both electoral success and in terms, I'd say, of ideology, a programme. Nearly all the programme is being driven by Dominic Cummings. So what else could make him so indispensable? We do not know. I mean, it's quite clear, and people have said this, I don't think it's outlandish, that he would have got permission to break lockdown. He was in contact with Number 10 Cabinet Office all the time. He would have been in contact and he would have told them where he was. So in that simple way, and what the whole country cares about is, why did I not see my relative, my son, my grandmother, my parents? Some of them were ill, some of them have died. Why did he get to see them? Well, the problem is that permission was probably given to Boris, by Boris Johnson. So Johnson is tied to him on that particular wheel of fire. But I think there's more. I think without Cummings, Johnson's government would be empty. He provides most of the rationale. He has spent, there are, we can't lost count of all the contracts, especially on health data to big tech companies in the US, like Palantir and his own particular favorite that came out of Vote Leave, uh, a group which used to be called ASI Data Science, who did his modeling for him at Vote Leave, and now called Faculty AI, who has seven contracts with the government, apparently involved in the back end of that app. So there's both a commercial and a kind of ideological techno-libertarianism driving Cummings, which doesn't drive Boris Johnson. Now, you also have to wonder what else Dominic Cummings has on Boris Johnson. Boris Johnson has, you know, considerable number of skeletons in his cupboard, whether it's in his personal life, you know, questions about, you know, vote leave overspending, the Arcuri relationship has not been referred, it's been scoped out, they say they're not investigating further, but just the nature of Boris Johnson. We can imagine that perhaps you know, Dominic Cummings has other material that he could use against him. One thing, I mean, I have no personal antipathy towards Dominic Cummings. And actually in private, I'm sure he's a charming man, but his public persona is vituperative, it's antagonistic, he doesn't like the press, it is sneering. And I think he works in the shadows. He works scaring politicians. People who defy him, Damien Collins, called him to Parliament to explain the vote leave overspend. He refused to come. He was held in contempt of Parliament for refusing to come to Parliament. And lo and behold, Damien Collins loses his chairmanship of the DCMS Select Committee, which had called Cummings. So he is vengeful politically and people are scared of him. The analogy with Steve Bannon, the uh, US master of the digital arts, if you like, who was uh, Donald Trump's campaign manager is not accidental. And actually, we know that Steve Bannon was advising Boris Johnson. We don't know if Dominic Cummings ever met Vladislav Surkov, for example, though 
Emily Thornberry made an allegation in Parliament that the Russia report concluded that he did. But we don't know whether he met Steve Bannon. But the techniques are very much the same. Outright populism. A lot of Steve, you know, Steve Bannon founded Cambridge Analytica as well as taking over Breitbart. Cummings is clearly in that same mode and that same genre of loving the digital aspects of modern campaigning, but also wanting to remain in the background. As soon as these people get visible, they kind of lose their power. Their power comes from being invisible but all-powerful, like God was once described. So Dominic Cummings has managed to get away with it for 20 years. You know, his moments he's left the public line, like gone into a bunker, read all these books on science. But two years ago, they got away with quite the most expensive, extensive electoral wrongdoing we can find in the last 100 years. There was a police inquiry which took two years was silently dropped or slowly dropped after, you know, the electoral law seemed shaky. That, and what happens to people like that is a sense of impunity begins to overcome them. That got away with that, wins election for Boris, you know, and arrogance takes over. And you think, well, I can, if I can get away with that, I can get away with anything. I can gull the British people in the Northern Wall, the Boris is going to look after them. If I can gull people, we're going to spend 250 million on the NHS a week. You know, you can get away with anything. And that's where the hubris comes in. Also, did people care? Of course people care about Brexit, but it wasn't immediately life-threatening, unless perhaps you were a European citizen here, not be able to you know, get residency. You know, electoral wrongdoing, even Facebook hacking, well, it's kind of abstract. Populism is destroyed by the coronavirus. It's a real thing. It's not an idea. It's not, it hits all of us. It's not, it doesn't have any racial, break. well, it affects black and Asian minority and ethnic people, but not because of genetic reasons, because of poverty. It has no discrimination. It's science you're working with. And I don't think populists can cope with that. What is clear from Boris Johnson's reaction and Cummings' kind of dismissive, sneering contempt outside his own house, you know, he said to journalists, you got this wrong like you got Brexit wrong. So he's making it a completely politicised thing about breaking lockdown and seeing your parents. That, I mean, there are 40 million people at least, who are heartbroken because they can't see a son or a daughter or a parent or a grandparent. That is not like this flow spending. That's not like some obscure rule about Brexit. That is personally painful for people to see somebody defy the rules, especially somebody who says, I'm fighting against unelected elites. That's been coming to his whole line for 20 years. I'm fighting against unelected elites. And here is a man who went to Oxford, knew Norman Stone, is married to the daughter of a baronet, defying lockdown at least once, probably twice, and maybe three times, showing no remorse. You cannot, he's missed what other people are going through. They feel the same. They abided by the rules. On my Twitter feed, there are dozens, hundreds of people upset. Because they did this, they, I didn't, it was a minor thing, I didn't go see my son for his 30th birthday. Other people have much more tragic stories. They couldn't say goodbye to a loved one who died. A single parent locked down with a kid with learning difficulties. Endless stories of people who sacrificed for the common good. And we're told he obeyed his instinct. Well, if we all obeyed our instinct, this society would collapse. We do things for other people's families. We save other people from getting the virus. We don't go out to enjoy ourselves and see our relatives in case that hurts somebody else. Society is built on this. I think they've misread the nation and misread the woman. How can that happen? You know, these are the smartest people who go, you know, uh, take back control, get Brexit done and win, you know, by large margins. Well, not Brexit, but the last election. The problem with data, the, you know, the problem with all these kind of heuristic you know, if you like, yeah, data-driven exercise, they're always a snapshot of the past. And you can't get ahead of it. You can, only, you can manipulate what there is there, you can manipulate people to see reality a certain way, but A, reality bursts through, you cannot control reality, even with a massive ad spend digital arts. You just cannot control the events they're boy, events, as Macmillan said. And they are measuring something that's changed. What's changed in the British nation is we have obeyed lockdown. I mean, the amazing thing is, despite the kind of 
the casual kind of laissez-faire attitude of the government, how responsible the British people are. When I go out, I think sometimes too many people, people keeping their social distancing, they have internalized these rules. They are in a way, as Dominic always wanted them to do, taking back control. And these people have not realized that because they not, don't mix with the people. They're not, Boris Johnson has not lived an ordinary life. He's gone from Eton to Oxford, to the Spectator, to the mayor's office and parliament, and then number, no, foreign office number 10. That's not normal. Dominic Cummings has not lived an ordinary life. They can read people in data ways and they can manipulate certain emotions. But a dynamic situation where people think very strongly, you have to have different skills. You have to really feel the nation and I'd say have a moral core of empathy. You know, what is it like for somebody else in this situation? How are they going to read my actions? They've completely misread that. And that shows, I'm afraid, I'm not saying this personally, so it's politically, a kind of sociopathy at the heart of the Johnson administration. I mean, we always suspect it was there just because of the way, the bad things they've done. But this really confirms it. And that is, in a way, karma. You know, you, at the more arrogant get, the more you get away with it, the more you display who you, what you really feel politically about the British people that they're kind of your servants, you're not public servants, they're your servants, it will always come out. The problem with lies and the problem with the kind of compromise blackmail model of intimidation, which Cummings represents, there's many more who do this, is they drag a whole load of other people with them. You know, a whole load of cabinet ministers. Those who have in a way enabled Cummings being close to him, being afraid of him, thought he was a good source, thought he was an interesting guy, I'm sure he is an interesting, sounds a very interesting guy, doesn't he? Um, but that's not public service. I think a lot of people would be caught up in that and a lot of people would be ashamed. Um, on the BBC, I do think Laura Kunzberg made a huge mistake on tweeting positively, hell of a story, the Neil Ferguson story, and then rebutting the mirror investigative journalist when that broke about Dominic Cummings breaking lockdown. It's just an extraordinary thing to do. I hope she regrets it. I think there are some great, Emily Maitlis has done a brilliant documentary, by the way, on Dominic Cummings with some amazing footage of him threatening to beat, beat people up in a studio and all that kind of stuff, or coming out of a studio. So hopefully there's a sea change with the media. They're no longer so scared, there's strength in numbers, and their public care about this, you know, it's not like, it's been leading this story on the BBC, which ignored Cambridge Analytica and Vote Leave Wrong Day. This has been leading for two days, you know, because they know the public care about the suffering they've made for lockdown. So I think you'll see a lot of people deleting their tweets. I think you'll see some people disgrace. I think that it's become clear that we are many, they are few. I think there is kind of last day of Rome feeling about this. You can never be sure people recover. I think we can't ignore the fact that we have the highest death rate in Europe when it comes to the coronavirus pandemic. We can't ignore on the seven day rolling average, we still have, I think it varies, but one of the top two or three ongoing highest mortality rates per head in the world, i.e. we screwed this up. Who was in power at that time? Johnson was pretty absent through the early days of the crisis. In January, February, March, he was away, he was on holiday, he was writing a book, allegedly something. We know that Dominic Cummings was at Cobra meetings. We know he was at SAGE meetings. The Sunday Times, I always suspected, and it's in his paper, it's a discussion of herd immunity. This idea came from him, this catastrophic idea. It's a quasi-science that you could defeat the virus through letting it run wild, take it on the chin when we do not know if there is much immunity to the virus and it's a public health policy that always happens with a vaccine in the past. Cummings has now said, or rather a reporter said very clearly, oh, he really had a Damascus moment. Sunday Times reported he'd been for herd immunity, paraphrase, so what if some old people had died? He's denied that, but he has not denied. He then was a sudden change of policy in mid-March and say, no, we've got to have a lockdown. So the admission is Dominic Cummings had more power over SAGE and the pandemic response than the Prime Minister. And then probably Matt Hancock, because Matt Hancock was saying they hadn't followed herd immunity, it was Valance and Halpern from the Nudge Unit saying they were going for herd immunity. So 
it, it does corrode the whole government. You cannot, C Cummings goes, he was driving a lot of that machine and is smart enough to drive that machine, even though we might say the wrong bloody direction. So there's the sense of that incompetence now without him. I've compared this, I think, previously on a double down uh, thing with the Iraq war and the, you know, herd immunity to be a bit like WMD, a sort of a fake paradigm that turned out not to be true and caused a lot of carnage. But this is like that, uh, more like David Kelly, I think, the, without invoking the name, a man who sadly died, you know, that we have this sort of very personal story. In the end, it comes back to how we respond to the coronavirus, how the government is performing. So if Cummings comes or goes, whatever happens to him, this has hollowed out any sense of competence in the government. Those extra deaths, which we will, if lockdown's broken too quickly, will mount again. But at this rate, they could be put to the door of Boris Johnson and Dominic Cummings. And the messaging they gave to the public, right from herd immunity now to ignore the lockdown. And that they will always be tarnished with that. I'm sorry. And this is not abstract. 61,000, 2,000, if you take the excess deaths uh, measured by the uh, ONS, Office of National Statistics, the Financial Times, there's 62,000 people have already died. Those people will have 20 relatives. That's a hell of a lot of people, let alone all the people like me who've got ill. Some people suffer bad side effects and scared. Nah, it's, this is, as our editor, <laughs> Hardeep Matharu put it in an article, and I, uh, it is Britain's Chernobyl. And what did Gorbachev say after the Soviet Union collapsed? It collapsed partly because of Chernobyl. And I think it's just a feeling in there, this could well be that. Everybody loves the story of the Emperor's new clothes, that the Emperor is actually naked for his charm and bluster. Boris Johnson looks pretty naked at the moment. And the thing about emperors having no clothes, you need somebody to point out that they're naked. And one of the organizations between telling the truth for a long time now is Double Down News. So go on to Patreon and support them.